Hello, welcome to Drugs Unwrapped with me, Rob. Uh, I'm delighted today that I am joined by Fiona Spargo Mabs, OBE, who is the mm -hmm. founder and director of the drugs education charity DSM Foundation. Fiona, welcome. How are you? You okay? Hi, I'm fine, thank you. So, Fiona, um, for my first question actually, and it's not actually on the agenda, and I've literally mm -hmm. just thought of it. OBE. That's that's pretty oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that was it, um, a year ago. So I got it just over a year ago in the castle. So it was in the New Year's Honours. I know, and it's for um, it's for services to young people, which is like for me is the best thing I could possibly have it for. But it's a bit kind of bittersweet. I mean, I'm, I'll tell you a little bit about why I started the charity and why we do what we do. But it's all kind of around the loss of my son Dan when he was sixteen. So there was. All of these things are a bit kind of, oh, my goodness, that's amazing. A, it's amazing. B, I really honestly don't deserve it. But also, I'm only doing all this because Dan isn't here and I would trade it in a million billion times over if I had him back. So, you know, there's anyway, sorry, that's that sounds very ungracious. But um, and 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 launches the podcast on a on a on a sober note so sorry but yes no thank you very much it was it was very special and I got it from the king as well which was very nice oh wow okay yeah, <laughs> yeah you've obviously mentioned in terms of, of Dan and we'll, I'm sure we'll get on to Dan very very quickly so the mm. DSM foundation uh, for those that obviously don't know are you able to explain ultimately um, with you being the founder of it why did you set up that foundation and, and ultimately what it is and, and and obviously it's been around since 2014 so to share that kind of 10-year sure. journey as well yeah sure so um we, we started the charity in response to our son dan dying taking having taken mgma and um that was 10 years ago and we started the we started a drug education charity ridiculously quickly. We'd, we were registered with Companies House eight days after Dan died. We just were left with this. We have got to do this just does not need to happen. You know, there is something that nobody needs to come to harm from drugs. And and if we can do anything to, to, to stop anybody coming to any sort of harm, Dan's obviously was the worst case scenario. I'll tell you that Dan, Dan was our, we had two boys. Dan was our youngest son. And um when he was 16, uh, he came home from school one day in January on a Friday and he just asked if he could go to a party that night with some friends not far away. And so I did all that usual kind of to and fro. Where's it going to be and who'll be there and when will he be back and how's he going to get back? And it, there were just a few things that were a bit kind of mm, really. I mean, it was a little bit further away than parties. And normally they'd just be around someone's house, very local and their parents, but, you know, that sort of thing. This was a little bit it's a friend of a friend one stop on the train but so not super far but anyway I said that he could go and Dan was in a really good place you know, he was doing really well at school he was um he'd gone into sixth form he was he'd been voted prom king the summer before you know he was one of those people everyone because he was lovely everyone kind of he was just and he was just great at being friends with uh, literally everybody and um he'd just been in school production you know he was he was doing really well um, and so I said yes and off he went but it was it was never a party it was this illegal rave miles away from us we live in South London it was it was right out the other side of London um, and it was mostly friends of a new friend and there was this plan to um, go to this rave and there's just this empty warehouse that obviously they'd broken into for the night and um, there was a plan that some of them were going to take MDMA and there's a whole kind of story around that which I won't go into in lots of lots of detail because there's lots of other things I want to talk to you about but it it just ended up very badly for Dan he he got what turned out to have been and just an incredibly high amount of MDMA in a little bag of white powder that looked to all intents and purposes the same as everyone but I mean that's that's the risk isn't it with with illegal drugs you just you just don't know um and Dan didn't know enough he 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 massively overheated and um, he spent a couple of days in intensive care on life support and died from multiple organ failure. And it's it's just such a complete total waste um, and it just doesn't need to happen. And 
it made me realise a lot of things. Um, obviously, we we didn't feel we were ignorant about drugs. You know, we knew drugs were around and about for young people. Um, I knew that Dan loved a new experience and he was curious and he loved an adventure and he could be a bit outrageous. You know, there were things that of the two, of my two boys, if there was going to be one that would go, oh, I wonder what this would be like. It was it would be Dan. But he was also, on the other hand, he was he was very he was very kind of sensible and quite cautious around risk as well. He would take a risk, but he would be he would take a bit of time to kind of weigh it up first. And it turned out this was the third time he'd taken MDMA. We knew absolutely nothing. But over a very short space of time in sixth form, over just a couple of months, really, and a friend gave him a bit to try the gig and then got him and other friends some of her own from Adina, which he hadn't really enjoyed, hadn't really wanted to go to this rave and this whole kind of, you know, the whole kind of backstory, which made just the whole narrative, again, so many learning points, which unfortunately Dan can't learn but other young people can but it just it made us realize I guess how much closer drugs were to our door than we had thought um it and how easy it is for any young person to find themselves in a situation that has the potential to go badly wrong thankfully mostly it doesn't go anywhere near so badly is it wrong as wrong it did for Dan but it there, there is, there is so many, so many things that can be done to avoid any kind of harm, but without a really good drug education behind them, which Dan, it turned out, didn't have, nor did his friends. You're really disadvantaged as a young person. It's the stage of life when your brain is least useful for you when it comes to kind of managing those social situations involving decisions and particularly kind of managing risk and particularly when you're with your friends which is when drugs and alcohol are going to be around um so having that really good understanding of of what those risks might be understanding how they can be reduced but also knowing having the kind of understanding but also skills to manage those decision making situations yeah. is just so important for absolutely everybody and I've been a, a teacher for I've been teaching for 24 years now so I mean a long time I was an English teacher originally and um, I worked with quite vulnerable families so that was most of my work working in in South London in the community um, but I taught all sorts of things, English in all sorts of shapes and forms DCSE A level the teach training stuff and and very very basic adult literacy and you know everything in between so um I guess I knew about teaching and learning and a lot of the work that I was doing was working in partnership with schools mostly little ones primary schools early years settings and things so there were things that I that I, I kind of got um things that I, I that I knew and I guess as a teacher you always think education is the key to a lot of reducing a lot of harm that is around for people of all ages um, and negative outcomes that can be. So we started a we started a drug education charity because we recognised that there was an enormous gap in terms of the provision for young people and the support and resources that were available to schools. You know, it wasn't that schools didn't think this was important, but being able to do that at all and knowing how to do that well. Um, how, why would schools necessarily know that unless there's somewhere they can go to find that out? They've got so many other really important things to do. So so I set to kind of learning my trade really that first year, um, connected with, we're fortunate to be given some really, really brilliant connections with all so many key people working in the sector. So um, I did lots of reading, research, talking, listening, um, lots of connecting with people. Um, and and we got going. And our vision has always been and remains that every young person in the in the UK has has access to the drug education they need to enable them to make safer choices when they come their way. And they and we know that they just become increasingly difficult to avoid as young people go through their teens. And we know that most young people aren't using drugs, and of those that do, most don't come to harm. Um, but there are risks around for, for any young person. And the way that's changed, actually, I know we'll probably talk a bit later about how things have changed over the last decade that we've been doing this. But we start, so our drug education programme has kind of evolved 
we started in really just with two schools in summer 2015, two very local schools who were willing to be kind of guinea pigs and piloted our lesson. We developed some lesson plans and resources for year nine, 10 and some stuff for parents. And um, we piloted that with just a couple of schools and, and, that, and that from there just grew and grew and grew. And we're now working with more than 700 schools across the UK. And it's that's been mostly pretty much entirely word of mouth and recommendation, which is great. And we've kind of been running to catch up with it really all the time. So we've been really kind of pushed it very much. <laughs> um, but we've got this, we've developed this multi-component programme because, and it's a universal drug education programme. So it's for anybody, anywhere, any setting. We work with so many different schools, every different sort of school that you could imagine from incredibly posh boarding schools to very ordinary academies in, in all sorts of different communities and, and locations. But we've got these different elements on the basis that there's not going to be one silver bullet, you know, there's not going to be one thing that works for everybody, but ways of reinforcing those messages for young people and coming at them from different directions. The more you can do that, the more chance any young person stands when it is a programme that's designed for everybody. So we've got lesson plans and resources for teachers to use to teach all the way through secondary school. We've got a programme for transition for primary as well. Um, we've got a team of drug educators that go into schools and colleges and wherever to deliver interactive workshops with students. We do um, workshops and, and webinars, a lot of that's still online for parents and carers. Um, we do training for, for teachers, but all sorts of other professionals that work with young people. We've got a youth ambassador programme, so that's a school-based programme that will train um, originally targeted at older students so we just got it accepted by Duke of Edinburgh actually as a skill thing oh, which wow. is amazing yeah so that's going to be on their their yeah. um as, a, as an option on their website for for young people so we adapted it for slightly younger students as well but we we, we created it really for year 12s to be those like that youth voice in their school to to um, be that positive peer influence and then we've got a, a play we've got a, a play that we commissioned so there's a theatre and education production as well so all of those different kind of ways of coming at something that they're all designed to kind of strengthen and reinforce each other um but in in practice most schools will do one or two or three and kind of fit it around other things it might be the only thing they do they might have other resources there are other speakers that they use but it's all evidence-based as well which is so important because there is there's a good evidence base of what works in drug education and we were really fortunate one of the really really useful connections at the start was with mentor uk which was for many years that really the leading drug education charity in the uk and sadly folded a few years back now but we were just as we were developing our materials they were developing their quality mark for providers of drug education and asked if we would be one of the pilot providers which was amazing because that was such, I mean, very, very, very rigorous pages and pages and pages of, of, of um, kind of assessment criteria and, and, and a, a checklist of basically everything that is in that evidence base and coming come at from looking at all the different kind of layers of what we might be doing. And so everything from the start was mapped to that. It was all based on that evidence and it has been from since then so everything we do and also it's also really been important to us always to make sure that we're checking it that it's doing as well as it can too so obviously we we evaluate everything internally we ask for feedback for everybody for everything um, that's doing it but we've also been working with Middlesex University since 2016 um, they published an initial assessment of three different bits of our drug education program back in 2019 um, but over the last um, year we've we had some of the um, I don't know if you were of the, the government released some funding under the innovation fund for um, reducing demand for illicit substances it was to identify programs that were effective and reducing demand for illicit substances and we got phase a grant for phase one we should be able to um, confirm very soon about the phase two grant but that is much more intensive and that will enable us to work with 12 very different schools across um, England um, with the University of and Bangor University actually is involved in that as well. Hopefully by the time this goes out I will have been able to confirm that we've got this <laughs> contracts and things aren't signed yet so um, 
yeah, a couple of people from Bangor involved uh, who are, um, um, I've got to forget the phrase right, it's kind of cost consequences, health economists. So they're okay. looking at kind of the cost effectiveness of it. Um, but we've got this, uh, it, that will be fantastic. So that will be evaluating that full multi-component program, all those different elements with year nines and tens in very, very different schools. Um, so getting that, finding out what works and why and for whom and how we can make that better. Um, that's also always been really, really important. And, and doing things more widely as well. So we've got our own drug education programme that we provide and the resources, the lesson resources particularly, they're, they're just there for anybody. So if anyone's listening, that, that would be useful. Would you just have a look at the website and they're free and you can download them and have a look and use them. Um, and then other things, obviously, that the, the, uh, there, there may start to be some kind of cost involved to us. And so um, if we're sending somebody out, but but all we've got something that is available totally free of cost for, for, for each other, for everything, for everybody. Um, so there are things that we're doing but we are just a relatively small charity still based in South London, but all over the place. Um, but that vision of making sure that all young people have access to really effective drug education and the drug education that they need, which will be different things for different young people. That doesn't have to be us doing that. So alongside what we've been doing directly, um, we've been doing all that we can to try and influence change, influence policy work with other organisations, um, various different things. Um, I started a working group back in 2021 um, to address the, the issue of young people's exposure to drugs on social media and the risks that, that can present. So that's still going strong, which is brilliant. And that brings together TikTok, Meta, Snap, um, various different government departments, National Police Chiefs Council, um, National Crime Agency, the um, Ofcom, the independent regulator, got various other third sector organisations involved in that as well. So that kind of platform where bringing people together and where I can be part of something as well. So I was, I don't know what happened under the new government with the drug strategy, but I was part of the Home Office Programme Board that was responsible for the reducing demand strand of the drug strategy. Okay. So again, being able to be hopefully maybe influence be part of hopefully a voice for drug education um, and the importance of that most recently we just launched a drug education forum um, so do have a look there's a website drug education forum um, .org.uk. So, so we launched it, but in partnership with we've, we've got a steering group. So it's not it's not us, but we kind of kicked it off, and it it's really actually picking up the legacy of Mentor UK again. Um, they had a, a brilliant community of practice that brought together different providers and practitioners, all about upholding evidence based standards and um, informing and equipping the sector and being a voice to advocate for drug education for all young people. Um, so that's really exciting. It just started, we launched it in February. We just had a couple of events. We're hoping that we might get some funding to enable us actually to do a little bit more than just scrabbling around everyone doing things kind of on top of their day jobs. But that's engaged a, a, a really wide audience from lots of different sectors, a lot of young people's practitioners, actually, a lot of people working in universities, uh, people working um, in drug education in various different shapes and forms and harm reduction. So it's not kind of and I'm the kind of the classic universal drug education school based stuff, but but much, much broader than that, because we're all doing we're all working towards the same aim that that young people don't come to harm from drugs. And we're doing that in different ways um, and using education through that in various different ways. So I did warn you that I do talk a lot. <laughs> No, it's, it's, it's fascinating stuff. What, what's your feelings then, Fiona, in terms of when you hear about young people that they they still don't get drug education or at least they don't get adequate drug education? And I say that because I used to be a young, work, young person's worker. I used to go into the schools, you know, for, for two or three years. It was the the kind of primary role of my job at that time and and some schools were brilliant other schools it kind of just felt like they were just ticking a box you would just see potentially one year group and that's all you 
ever kind of see when you went into those schools. So essentially, those individuals, those young people that went to those specific schools, literally got, you know, an hour or two of drug education throughout their whole school career. So, and if they were off sick that day, they got nothing. Yeah, <laughs> they so, bumped off because it was a drop down day and they're really boring generally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's it. That's it gone, isn't it? Yeah. How does that make you feel when you you hear of kind of instances like that? It is so frustrating. I mean, obviously, we 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 are because we grew so rapidly, we've we've been fairly responsive. So we we work with schools that want to work with us rather than knocking on doors. Um, so I don't know, there may be many schools that so all the schools we're we're working with do something because they do something with us. And we know that some of them do work with other organizations and have other resources, but we know that exactly that happens still. You know, there'll just be a workshop in year nine and that'll be it. Um and or there'll be, I don't know. You know, we've got we've we've got the 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 play. The play doesn't do the play. It's a brilliant tool. I'll hopefully talk a bit more about the play in a bit. Brilliant tool for engaging young people and, and kind of getting them kind of more receptive to to drug education. But it but it won't do drug education for you. And it's just so frustrating that that. And again, I get that schools have got so much that they're being asked to do um, and an increasing range of things that they're being asked to kind of share responsibility for protecting young people from but um, and and also expected to get young people getting really good grades and having really good progression opportunities out out of you know beyond school so that there's a lot that schools are being asked to do but it is so frustrating because it's so important and I know that there are there are so many things that are so important it's so important that young people leave school able to read and write and do the maths that they're going to need for their adult lives and 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 be able to do all the stuff that they need to do but it's so important the staying safe stuff is just the life stuff that all that well-being stuff is so incredibly important and it can so easily get sidelined in schools because of the pressure that's on and because of budget cuts you know it, it's at, very often if, if drug education is being taught it's being taught by whoever happens to have a free lesson in their timetable it's not by somebody that's been trained somebody who's got confidence to talk about whatever the subject is somebody who's got that kind of respect that they need to have in the relationship with their class where the, the class will listen to them, where they've got that kind of authority. And they probably would much rather be getting on with marking and not talking to a class about sex or drugs or any of the other things that, that are some of the most important topics as far as I'm concerned, um, but can be most uncomfortable for the average teacher. So some schools, as you say, do it really brilliantly. And I'm, I am sure that all schools want to do it well, but not all schools give it the the priority that it needs to and i'm i am always loath to criticize schools because they because as i say they just got so much they are asked being asked to do so much but that's why something like the drug education forum i think has such an important role to play in kind of in all directions you not not just in terms of policy makers but also in terms of the schools themselves and having a really good understanding of of what drug education needs to look like and it doesn't shouldn't look like getting someone in to do a workshop to the whole year group in when they're 14 and then that's it you know what 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 does that need to look like and where can they go for good resources to support them to do that yeah and I know you mentioned a bit earlier on you know in terms of what drug education looks like and I think a lot of people you know when I talk to people outside of the field you know if I ever kind of mention drug education and stuff like that people kind of just have this um, vision that you're just talking to them about drugs and stuff and and like mm. I mentioned you, you you said earlier on actually you know it's about developing life skills and you know is is a, a huge yeah. element of it yeah. um, as well because once people are out in that real life situation you know having those kind of life skills and I know kind of reading on your website as well you know stuff around peer pressure and how to deal with those situations that for me anyway that that's hugely important as well yeah. as kind of because you can't go through all the different drugs can you you can't you know 
I, don't, I, I can't imagine anybody really wanting to sit there and the, listening about all the different drugs and the effects and the risks because mm-hmm. you know you'll you'll lose your audience pretty quickly um just kind of relaying that information yeah, off. yeah. Um, and obviously yeah you can't do that in a very limited time even with the schools that potentially you know do it do it really well um but is that a big element of, of what you provide in terms of providing that kind of life skill element to your yeah, to your education ab- absolutely it's it's so important and i should say that drug education is statutory in england schools in england now and i know that in other the other devolved nations as well there are curricula that are, that are available but certainly the the relationship sex and health education framework so it's really good that it is schools now have to do it but it's it's all that whole framework is a list of knowledge you know it's just it's, Pupils will know, pupils will know. And then but knowledge is so important. It's so important that it's relevant and current and up to date. It's relevant to that group of students, to that particular area or to whatever it is. Um, but it's also so important. It's not enough. You can have, I mean, whatever age you are, you can have a head full of knowledge and understanding of something, but still make some daft decisions when you're with in a social environment. Um, you know, we as adults, you can still feel that kind of social pressure to have another drink beyond what you actually really comfortably want to, because yeah. <laughs> everyone's going, oh, go on, just another, you know, so so never more so than in adolescence. So absolutely, that, that understanding, we, we talk really, um, uh, we, we talk explicitly about adult adolescent brain development and what's going on in their heads and that rewiring process obviously in an age appropriate way it's very simpler simpler for the younger years but for the for six forms you can go they're actually really really interested we we survey schools before we go in um, year 11 12 13 we send a survey out because we want to hear from them what do they want from this what do they think is most relevant what are the things that they they think their year group are coming across what are the substances that it mean I and mean, it's always vaping it's, it's alcohol weed top of the list but then there can be other things that might kind of jump out in some places and we think oh maybe we ought to do something on ketamine here or perhaps perhaps actually steroids is something that they is coming out and they might be aware so um but but having that understanding of um, adolescent brain development comes really way up at the top of that list harm reduction stories actually are top understanding how to stay safe really really way up to the top understanding adolescent brain development um, and how to to manage those social situations is also way high up understanding addiction is also really high up as well young people really want to understand what does that actually look like you know is there a line that you suddenly cross where you're you were fine and now you're not or um, how do you know and then what can you do so understanding why it's difficult and why you're more likely to take risks when you're with your friends because of those key areas of your brain being out of you know, your prefrontal cortex that helps you think things through and, and, and manage risk and impulse is just not fully connected. And that limbic system, all that social emotional stuff is really, um, really, really so hypersensitive and, and really overdeveloped. And that kind of that mismatch can mean it's difficult. So kind of understanding that, but and then having some strategy. So what can you do? How can you come at those situations? What can you do? Getting ideas from young people is is such a brilliant resource because they've got lots of stuff that they've done already, but also thinking through what would work in different situations and some will be able to just say that's not you do your thing I'll do my thing that's fine but other people aren't so comfortable doing that so we also talk about how could you get your friends out out of a situation and if you're someone that can be more bold it's often much easier to get your friend out of something than it is for yourself so how can you be an ally how can you how can you wiggle them out of something or how can you just stick up for them if you think that they're they're somebody that somebody's kind of quite 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 obviously pressuring but it but of course that peer pressure can look like so many different things it's not always just someone going do it do it do it we yeah. won't be a friend if you don't do it often it's so much more subtle than that isn't it it's kind of that sense of everyone's doing it I'm going to miss out maybe they won't see me the way that I want them to if I don't perhaps it's going to be fun um yeah so so absolutely that's part of it and also the signposting and what you're saying about you can't possibly even if you wanted to tell them about every possible substance that they may come across and all the risks and effects and the legal cons you know whatever um 
So knowing where to go for reliable information is also so important because um, you can go down some really dodgy rabbit holes on Google if you start looking stuff up about Absolutely. drugs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not always the best sources, especially if you get on a chat uh, about stuff. Um, so knowing where to go that's reliable, but also knowing where to go for support and what that might look like. Um, and we talk also talk about if you're if you're struggling with stuff, you know, and and young people are, are are very aware that their peers may be using substances to help them cope with things that are really difficult. So, where can you go? Can you go anywhere? Where is there online that's reliable? We will signpost to Young Minds, um, to Hopeline UK, Papyrus Trust. If people are feeling really really low, all worried about their friends as well, um, but but finding somewhere that they can go that isn't drugs and alcohol if they're struggling to cope with stuff who 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 could you talk to in school have you got someone at home that you could talk to is there someone outside school and home that you trust um yeah so so there are so there are so many different elements to drug education beyond just you know, Young people often still expect us to be coming in and saying, don't do drugs, drugs are bad. <laughs> so you think, I don't know where this comes from, whether there are schools that are still just doing that. I mean, of course, that's always going to be your safest option. But would that you could tell sure. a teenager not to do something and they wouldn't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Can't tell anybody not to do something. And, um, <laughs> I'm sure they'll do the opposite. <laughs> yeah, I think I think many of us in the field know, you know, that just say no campaign. Nancy Reagan, wasn't it, back in, yeah. or whenever it was, the 80s, and then obviously it just tragically failed. And it tragically failed because there was nothing to say why, do you know, yes. there, was, there was no explanation. It was just quite literally just saying no from that. Fiona, I want to bring you on to the, the play. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested, you know, in kind of reading about the, the play that um, has been developed uh called i love you mum and, and one of the things that i was in, incredibly impressed about is that you know since it's kind of been in production you know it's been studied taught and performed obviously across the uk but in australia yeah. in vancouver tasmania at the edinburgh fringe where i, where I was like <laughs> whoa okay that's uh, that's that's a unique one and then yeah it is now one of the set texts within the GCSE drama syllabus alongside, you know, William Shakespeare, of course, you know, that's, that's quite incredible. It's crazy, isn't it? Because it's, yeah. <laughs> cause it's, a, it's, so this was the, the first summer that it was examined on as a set tech. So um, it, sorry, I say it's crazy. I mean, it is amazing. It's crazy because it's our story and it's a verbatim play. It's Dan's story. So all the words in the play are the words of his family and friends. So what I have okay. to, we we commissioned it. It was one of the first things we did, really, because Dan loved drama and he loved his drama teacher and his drama teacher loved him. And she was one of our first trustees. And this was her idea. She said, you know, you really ought to think about drama. If you're going to... We'd started a drug education charity already. And um, she said drama is just such a powerful way to communicate a message to young people and Mark Wheeler was a playwright that she had taught for for years she loved him and and Dan had studied one of his plays at school in drama actually um and she asked if we'd mind if she contacted him on his website and didn't and he he came straight back and we were within it was six months after Dan died that we were doing the interview so he based in, he was then based in Southampton he was part Part, point 0.5 drama teacher at that stage, point 0.5 playwright. So he was working in a school in Southampton, Southampton Oasis Academy. Um, and he came up from Southampton, spent a couple of days with us doing a whole load of interviews with us. Um, so with me and Tim, my husband, Dan's big brother, Jacob, um, with his girlfriend, Jenna and her family, because they were they've been going out for more than two years. So Dan was very much part of her family and she was very much part of, well, you know, that. Um, so and, and with uh, with loads of Dan's friends and with Izzy, his, his drama teacher, and he kind of wove that together then and worked with his youth theatre company to create that into the play that became a published play. Um, but when we started that, we, he said, you know, I, I can't guarantee that this will be published. Of course he couldn't. I mean, you just don't know. Do you when you start writing something? He, he'd had loads of plays published. He'd won awards for, for play drama, his plays that been performed around the world. And, but you just don't know. And But I remember saying really early on, wouldn't it be amazing if it became a set text? 
and um, but never honestly thinking it would and then and then it did so in september so this was the first so this summer there were kids in exam halls answering questions about about us i mean i mean it's one of those things you have to just kind of just kind of put your fingers in your go la 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 and not really think about it too much because it is very weird but also amazing because we commissioned it with a whole but as part of this kind of we just need to try and get help young people understand what those risks are what the consequences can be how that social dynamic can work what they can do to try and make choices that are different than Dan did that night, uh, how they can make sure that they get to go home in one piece like he didn't. Um, and so that play is doing that work for us all over the place. And she say it's, it's one of seven set texts. It's Shakespeare. <laughs> I think yeah. it's, it's the, Jamie Priestley, Mallory Blackman. Um, and then there's Dan's stories, which is amazing. And we also commission mark to adapt that to tour as a shorter theatre and education production because we wanted that to be part of what we could then offer to schools so we know that drama it's kind of as a published text it's sort of out there doing its thing and we don't often know where it's being performed or studied or um but sometimes we do because schools contact us or or mark if he knows will, will always always let us know um and um but we wanted to be able to offer that, to be able to commission a professional theatre company to take that into schools. Um, and um, that's what we, we've we been doing now since 2017. So it's about, um, it's just short, the whole the whole play is, is quite long. It's too long to fit into a school timetable. So the touring production is about 50 minutes. And then there's an interactive workshop after that. It's about half an hour that the cast do. So it kind of picks up, so they're not just watching a, play that's quite a hard message um and then going off to maths or lunch or home or whatever but you've got an opportunity to just kind of go oh um and then also the the kind of so what the what next the some developing picking up on some of the key themes around decision making peer influence some practical strategies that they can take away um and just a bit more understanding of what the risks and what the effects can be a bit of myth busting so so there's a little there's a bit of a workshop that follows as well so so that's that's integrated into our program that's been touring we commissioned a theatre company to tour in london schools in 2017 it's been touring in london since then we had a little blip when it was covid we managed to fit most of the tour in before because it's it, it usually it's been touring in spring so we got most of the tour in before the schools were closed in march 2020 and then we lost uh we lost a year i think we did we get it back in 2022 i should know that but we but we certainly got it to scotland in 2022 um for the first time and the, the second theatre company that's been touring it um has has taken that again across across England as well as Scotland. We've we've been touring it in Scotland then since 2022. We just almost booked up the autumn tour for this year, which will be starting in a couple of months' time, which is really exciting. And we've got our first tour in Northern Ireland just for a couple of weeks in oh, cool. spring as well. So there's a northern there's a um a theatre company, youth theatre company based in Ballymena, who who did a production of the play with their youth theatre company um, and who connected with me somehow, I think maybe through Mark again, um, perhaps through his agent. So I did a I did a Skype, they got two youth theatre companies in different um different areas. Um, and I chatted with their with the the young people that were in the play, which I always, always love doing. So if anyone's doing the play, do drop me a line and I would love to chat to your to your students that are doing it. Um, but they wanted to do more, they 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 saw the impact that it had on their students it just there's something about the play that just engages young people in such a completely different way than anything else it's there's something about drama generally and something about that play in particular um i think some of it is i mean i'm horribly biased about how amazing dan was obviously because i'm his mum but there's he was he was su such an engaging person in life and continues to be through the play it's really funny it's outrageous in places it's but but also really very it illustrates how 
something that can seem very ordinary can end up going extraordinarily wrong. Um, and, at, and at how many points that that could be different. And so people watching the play, young people watching the play might identify with Dan. They might be identify with Jack, his best friend, who was there that night as well. And they might identify with Jenna, his girlfriend. They might identify, think about their mom. You know, we've had I've chatted to students after the play that gone, oh my goodness, I was just thinking about my mom all the way through that. And and how would she feel if that was me? And you know, so so find it 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 just there's it creates connections, I think. It it drama engages your imagination in a way that maybe like poetry and prose, sorry, it's me being an English teacher, but maybe like poetry and prose, you know, poetry, you kind of got to work a bit harder at, haven't you, than prose. You, you you've got to you kind of bring a lot of yourself to it and the same with with drama especially that sort of drama there's there's it's quite a sparse production there's not much in the way of scenery or props it's very physical theater there's you know there's there's a lot of there's multi-rolling you know so people a lot of different people are being Dan put the hoodie on you're then Dan so there's there's um there's a lot going on that just gets young people thinking about those really important messages. So whether it's through the touring production or through the performance, it just has such a very different impact. And we get such such incre incredibly positive feedback from young people and from teachers that have worked with young people on it. One of the things they say is it's so much better than a teacher standing up at the front of class with a <laughs> <laughs> And it's not saying, I mean, this is the just say no thing. I mean, I'm joking that it's your safest option. It is your safest option. Um, it's not a. It's not going to be a. It's not going to feel like an easy option always, or or the option that young people want to choose. And so our our message is all around choices, and we want to make sure whatever your choices, wherever they start, that they're going to finish somewhere that will enable you to 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 get home safely, to get home in one piece. I mean, that that sounds really simplistic, but you know that whatever that might mean, some people that will be, they're going to try something that maybe they're using something regularly. So for them, understanding how the risks they're taking can be reduced, where when to recognise that this is something that's getting out of hand and they need some help, how they can look out for their friends in those kind of situations, um, what, what, what they need to know some generic stuff about reducing risk, like, you know, start low, go slow, don't mix, all of that stuff, more specific harm reduction stuff to do with different substances. Um, and now that is a difficult message in universal drug education because you can't be to a universal audience where whatever age they are, most of them won't be using drugs, you can't be saying. So if you are gonna pop a pill at a party, you need to know that. Um, so we we frame that in terms of if you're with a friend that's going to pop a pill, you know, if you're with a friend okay, that's using yeah. drugs, this is the stuff that they need to know. And most importantly, they absolutely need you as a clear headed friend with them, keeping an eye on them, checking in on them regularly. So um, that that kind of it's 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 making sure that they've got that information in their back pocket as well. I think, you know, in terms of the drama aspect, kind of just listening to you there, because I was going to ask, you know, it, is the impact that you see in terms of upon the audience different to that from what you would potentially get from just a standard drug education session with like, for example, a professional or a teacher standing in front of a class PowerPoint, but, you know, you kind of articulated, you know, brilliantly in terms of what that different impact does look like and it's lovely as well you know kind of reading about Dan previously and obviously listening to you now you know in terms of kind of his own experience around drama and stuff you know that actually there's that connection there as well which is which is lovely and I could kind of you know from my perspective get that sense of you know yeah watching a play like that yeah it must get all sorts of thoughts running through people's minds and do you get a, a similar reception to two parents you yes. know or, and, and cares because I know you do training for them as well but but yeah as does it kind of maybe shift their mindset a little bit kind of around drug 
Yes, absolutely. So where we can hold community performances for parents to come along. Um, one of the one of the big things is just this could be anyone. That's what so many parents come away with and young people actually as well. But just you can have an idea in your head as a parent that for some parents anyway, you know, that it's kind of kids like that and it's families like that and communities like that. And, you know, but actually it, it could be anybody from any family in any community um, and that kind of this is really it's really important that's why working with parents has always been so important for us from the start my professional background most of my teaching was with parents with parents in quite vulnerable families with limited literacy whose children were underachieving or at risk of underachieving and working really intensively with them and with the school and um and i absolutely absolutely loved it and 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 the whole premise of that is that parents play a really key role in children's learning and it's the same whether they're three or four or whether they're 13 or 14 or 16 or 17 you know parents remain the most important influence in their children's lives it's so easy to lose confidence in that as a parent because you've got messages from all different directions that can kind of make you feel quite disempowered um that they're not listening to you they're just listening to their friends and of course their friends become very important and that's important in itself that process but as a parent or carer you are their front line of what's most important of values of a place a safe place to go ideally if they are struggling with anything and so both professionally but also my my own lived experience as a parent for whom it went horribly wrong you know making sure that other parents know enough and know how to go about those conversations at home that can sometimes feel quite awkward or uncomfortable um that's always been a really key part of what we do so whether it's the play or whether it's a workshop or webinar i've written a couple of books for parents we've got lots of resources on our website um resourcing parents to be that place that ki that their kids can go to when they need to really really important I was going to mention your books. So obviously you got one, I Wish I'd Known, and then the other one, Talking the Tough Stuff with, with Teens. Like like you mentioned, especially with, with young people, you know, parents and family, they are part of their social network, isn't it? And, you know, obviously it depends from family to family, but sometimes they're your closest allies. And you, you ultimately do, in an ideal situation, you want that relationship to be an open one where you can have those conversations. But... I could imagine mm -hmm. maybe from your own work and 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 obviously in terms of especially you know one of the books talking the tough stuff with with teens that actually those conversations may not be as open as as what they should be. Yeah, on both sides as well. I think it's easy for it's easy to forget as a parent that if we feel awkward about something, our teenagers probably feel ten times as awkward to come to to us. Um, the world and 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 also as a parent, you don't. I mean, with with something like drugs, it's so, the the world is so different than it was when when we were teenagers. You know, even I mean, you're terribly young, but even when you were a teenager, I'm sure the world was very different than it is now. Just you know, there was people may have been around weed, may have been around. I mean, depending on the age of the parents, you know, the MDMA had come over sort of early night, late eighties, early nineties. So there was stuff that was around, but other stuff in nitrous oxide, ketamine. I did an interview with BBC Radio London this morning about THC vapes, and we're talking to young people about spice now in a way that we just haven't done until landscape shifted and availability and and young people's exposure to synthetic cannabinoids which hasn't been an issue for so long for for, for the average teenager so things can really change so uh, making sure that parents understand that but but the bottom line is keeping that relationship of connectedness and communication connection is so key um Anything you can do through those teenage years to to keep those connections going when there is that inevitable shift, you know, teenagers are becoming they're working their way to to being an independent adult. They need to know that they're OK outside that safe, fam hopefully, ideally safe family unit. Um, so there is that kind of that tug and that push and pull. And that can be that, that shifting relationship, which can be really really painful or it can just be a little bit bumpy but whatever 
parents can do through that time to to keep those connections going. Any opportunity to be a taxi, any opportunity to get them to come on a dog walk together, whatever it is, just just two seconds of 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 chat about nonsense, you know, anything, just being there. Um, will mean that you you stand more chance of keeping those connections when there is a big important thing and that they'll they will feel that connection keeps helps communication communication helps connection and it can be so tough sometimes for some parents and some teenagers um but that's why i wrote the first book is very much more about um, was is specifically focused on young people drugs and decisions and there's lots of dan's story in there and i called it i wish i'd known because it's everything that I wish I'd known, you know, it's just everything. I wish I had been able to read that book. And and it's it's part memoir as well. So it's kind of bits of Dan's story that then lead into, so this is what would have been useful to know at this stage. So, um, and then the second one kind of developed from that in terms of just generally those conversations with teenagers. Why can they sometimes go, well, what's going on for them? What's going on for us? What's changed between being a teenager when we were in? now how can we kind of stand in their shoes um and then and then what can you do how can you there's so many different ways that if things are to stop try and stop things going a bit haywire and to get them back on track if they do and 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 and, and hopefully in a really 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 non judgmental way because i'm very far from standing in a place of of course you know my lived experience gives me no credibility in terms of being able to say I had it all sorted as a parent I absolutely most definitely didn't um, but also that book looks at seven specific areas that are really tricky to talk about so drugs and alcohol is there but also eating disorders and self-harm suicidality abusive relationships pornography you know all the things that are particularly awkward on both sides um, sexuality and gender identities there as well um, but um, I, I just, they're another way of trying to get those messages out to young people through the the people that are the biggest influences in their lives. So in terms of your books then, so where can people have a look, potentially purchase them? Where would be the pers- Where would be the place to, to go? Well, you can get them from our website and that actually gives us all the all the profits go to the foundation. So wherever you get them from, we'll get the royalties. So you can get them from Amazon. You can get them from any online retailer. Um, but we also sell them via the website. And we get them at uh, we get more of a take from them because we buy we buy them at author price and then we sell them at the cover price. So um, we sell them a bit cheaper than that, actually. But but yeah, you can get them from our website, but you can also get them. Anyway, sorry, there's an audio book. I forget about that the, for talking the tough stuff. Brilliant. Fiona, if people want to know more about the DSM Foundation, where do they go? How do they find out more and plug? Um, it's www.dsmfoundation.org.uk and DSM stands for Daniel Spargo Maps. Fiona, thank you so much for taking the time out. Mm, um, you know, it's it's in, just been incredible to, to hear from you and your story and um, you know, what you did, obviously a harrowing experience it must have been, you know, in terms of back in 2014 with, with Dan's passing. But I think what you've done since is just incredible. And Thank and you. even the, the the research I did beforehand, you know, actually there's, there's so much more that, you know, you're, you're doing than what I initially thought, which, you know, is, is incredible um, from obviously the, the foundation, play um you know writing the books being part of the working groups and i'm sure you know the the expansion will continue you know i'm sure in terms of utilizing your expertise so so fiona yeah thank you very much no Um, thank you it's a it's a privilege to be on your podcast which we love brilliant thank you fiona take care of yourself and and you everybody else we will see you soon take care bye bye If you have been affected by any of the issues discussed in today's podcast, please reach out. Barod have a free and confidential live web chat service that is available seven days a week on our website at barod.com where you can chat to a trained support worker. Alternatively, you can contact Wales's National Drug and Alcohol Helpline, Dan 24-7 either by calling 0808 
808-2234 or text DAN to 81066.